Well, good morning, family. It's good to be with you. Uh, we're going to be speaking today out of the Gospel of Luke, and so if you have a Bible handy, it'd be great if you could turn to Luke chapter 12, as well as Psalm 70. Uh, my name is Bill, and I'm one of the shepherds here at the gathering, and today I want to talk about a topic that um, isn't talked about a lot in church, and I can't figure out why, and I'll bring that up in a few minutes, but it has to do with the topic of envy. And then after we talk about that topic of envy, I want to look at the solution that Jesus offers us for when envy overwhelms us or when envy starts to creep into our lives. Let me begin, first of all, by talking, though, about envy. So envy, like, what exactly is it? And so I want to describe it um, simply and not, uh, not in some complex uh, psychological way, but just on a, on a daily basis way of how envy affects us. Envy is the outcome of comparing what you have to what another person has and you desiring to have that thing that the other person has. So envy happens when um, what you have is really what you want to have from them. It doesn't matter if you need that thing. It doesn't matter if that thing is good for you or if it's going to benefit you. You just want it regardless because that person seems to have something that you want. Envy actually begins to creep up in our childhood. It's very common on playgrounds to see children envious of another child's athletic skill or envious of their shoes or envious of their, their playground equipment that they got to play with. And the other child wants it, regardless if they really want it, regardless if they really are any skill, have any skill set for it. So that's where envy begins to creep in. And what happens is that envy, it, it uh, makes you hate the advantage, makes you hate the advantage that somebody else has. And whatever that advantage is, it might be an economic advantage, it might be a skill advantage, it might be a possession advantage, but it makes you hate that advantage that somebody else has, but paradoxically, you want to have and own that same advantage. You want it to be yours. You want to possess it as your own. So as a quick for instance of this, when you think back a year ago, March 2020, the very beginning of COVID, were you upset that others had toilet paper were you upset that others had cleaning supplies, paper towels, hand sanitizers? Were you upset about that as it relates to you? Or were you more concerned that your neighbor didn't have hand sanitizer or toilet paper or these other goods? That's a good measurement to see when we begin to envy things that we don't even necessarily need, but we feel we need. And it's a good measure to determine if we're envying or not, because if you didn't care if the other person, your neighbor, had these things, then most likely envy was taking over you a year ago at this time. Now, uh, before I, I go into the passages, I want to make two other points. First of all, envy is not jealousy. Jealousy is more of a, uh, it's a feeling of that you're being threatened that you're going to lose something that you have. It's usually, I'm going to lose uh, a friendship to another friend. I'm going to lose a job to another coworker. I'm going to lose, uh, you know, some some sort of possession to another person that seems to be gaining it uh, uh, advantage over that. So jealousy is really this feeling that you're threatened by losing something you already possess to another person. Envy is agonizing and desiring what somebody else has. So that's usually the the measurement of that is jealousy most oftentimes involves two people or, or two things, which one person, um, or I'm sorry, let me start all over. Jealousy involves three people. It's you and it's another person and then the, the object of that, those two people uh, losing that thing where envy always involves just two people. You're envious of somebody else's thing that they want. There's some, there's some similarities, but the easier way to understand envy as it relates to scripture, is it's akin or almost, some, almost the same as coveting. Envy and coveting is, is in the English language, is, is primarily the, the same thing or it's akin to it, which is that you want to take for yourself what is somebody else's. And so, you know, quite clearly, the Tenth Commandment is that you are not to covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And you can go back and read the Ten Commandments and look that one up, but that's one of the ten. Jealousy isn't listed in the 10, 
but coveting or envying something is listed in the number 10. And, and actually, envy is in a bunch of the Old Testament and New Testament naughty lists, the things you're not supposed to be doing, the things you're not supposed to be um, counted in your, in your uh, bag of goods of what you do and what you, what you, how you act and what you um, uh, do towards other people. Because envy has this binding and blinding power that destroys relationship, envy um, is spoken against in Scripture because it contravenes both the love of God and the love of, na- of, of neighbor. And we know this because 1 John 4.20 says that whoever claims to love God yet hates their neighbor is a liar or hates their brother and sister is a liar. And so envy typically has a hatred towards the, an object of, of, or the person uh, it may, maybe it's a movie actor, maybe it's an athlete, maybe it's a coworker or a boss. It might be a neighbor that has a better house. It might be a friend that has a, a car that's different than yours. Whatever it is, when you don't like them, and because of their um, possession or the thing you think you should have, that's envy, and that is spoken against all over Scripture, all over Scripture. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to pray here in just a second, but I'm going to close with just this introduction by saying, I challenge you, when it comes to envy, I challenge you to think of one person that you know that's envious, one envious person. I challenge you to say, are they also a happy person? In other words, do you know one envious person that you would categorize also as a happy and content person? Let's pray about God's word and looking at it as we uh, move forward. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today and we, we see where you talk about envy and how it affects us and then Jesus' solution for envy, God, I pray that you would speak deep into our hearts, not only with those who are struggling deeply with envying somebody else's relationship or envying somebody else's uh, financial situation or envying somebody else's work or a career path. God, I pray that not only would you speak to those who know that, they, that they're battling with envy, but God, you would also speak to those, all of us, I should say, who are in some way envious of another for some reason. And God, help us to apply the, this lesson of Jesus as it comes to your provision in our lives. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, again, I want you to start in Psalm 73, but we're actually in this series about, about Jesus' life in the, the book of Luke. So, again, you should be in Luke 12, and you should be in Psalm 73, because Psalm 73, it begins to describe envy and what it, how it plays in our heart and plays with our minds. And so I'm just going to begin by reading it. It says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Verse 2, But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. You know, this is that type of, of uh, poem or psalm that you begin to read and you're like, oh, I kind of get it and I kind of don't get it. So let me retell this in verse 1 and 2. What primarily the psalmist is saying is, in my head, I know, in my head, I know that God is good, that he blesses those who love him. Verse 2 But what I see and what I know in my head don't always play out in my heart. Instead, I tend to forget what I know and I lose my way. That's that's what he's driving at, that we what we know about God and how we actually live sometimes are are diabolically opposed or don't walk in sync with one another. And when this happens, when I when I'm not believing what God is doing for me and how he's providing for me and loving me and caring for me, I become resentful. And verse 3 and following begins to describe this issue of envy. It says, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. If you verse, go to verse 12, this is what the wicked are like. They're always carefree. They increase in wealth. And envy, what it begins to do is it begins to say to your mind, it begins to speak to you, 
in your heart, and it says this, I should have that thing, not them. I'm better than them. I'm, I'm purer than them. I worship more. Like, God, how come I go to church and I, and I worship you and I go to a home gathering and I serve and, I, and I'm committed to, to serving my neighbors and I do all these things and yet others are doing better than me financially who, who pay no regard to you. Others are in better health than me who pay no, um, uh, uh, they pay no mind of who you are and what your word has to say. And that's what, what this is saying is our hearts began to hear the words of envy and we began to say, I hate them and I hate what they have. And if they can't have, if I can't have it, neither should they. It's not fair, God. And we somehow get into this mode of thinking that, that envy um, is our way of measuring what is fair and what isn't fair in life. Well, envy, what it does is it makes us hate. And what hate does is hate causes us to never rejoice with those who rejoice, with those uh, who, who receive blessings. Romans 12, 15 tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice. But when we envy, we sin against those people because we refuse to rejoice with them. And instead, we're upset that they got to get a new car and you didn't. We get upset that their child is succeeding in school and yours isn't. You're, we get upset, upset that they got a raise and you got a demotion in pay. This is what envy does. This is what hate does. And what it begins to do is create this sin that within our heart. It's a secret sin. It's one that we don't share with a lot of people and it just eats us up and it starts burning us up inside. And sins, uh, this sin commits us to destroy the enjoyment of the blessing of the other people. We begin to talk bad about them. I was reading this story uh, about Cartier, and apparently Cartier bought this massive diamond. It was like 69 carats or some crazy weight of diamond, and he had it out in his display booth for people to come by and see. And you know, people they would come by and look, and the security guard said in two days he heard more sour grapes than he had ever heard in his entire life because people would walk by and go, oh, it's not that nice, or, or oh, it's too flashy, or it's too fancy. Oh, I would never wear something like that. But really what they were being is they were being envious of the ability to be able to purchase a diamond of that, that um, value because it was worth over a million dollars at that time. But they didn't want to admit that they were being envious, so instead they had to degrade the thing and make it something that, that they wouldn't want. But many of them made the closing comment, he said, this guard, when interviewed, but I wouldn't mind having it, or I would wear it if someone gave it to me, or I would take it if it was given to me, even though I don't think it's worth anything or it's not, it's not nice. So sin commits us to destroy the enjoyment of that blessing and it commits us to destroy a person or to destroy the possession of that person um, that they have. And so even though envy is spoken against throughout Scripture, like all over the place, it makes tons of the naughty lists, the things not to be doing. Seldom, though, do I ever hear envy preached against in the American church. And my belief is that it's a major challenge for us as Christians in America, envy is, because we live in a very capitalist country. And one of the fuels of capitalism is advertising. And advertising is all about you having. It's about you doing. Advertising is also about you having and doing so others will envy that you and that you're able to do and you're able to possess and have these things. Advertising makes you envy something that you don't have, and it makes you aspire towards things that you typically can't afford or don't need. And advertising often focuses you on good things in a wrong way. There's nothing wrong with wanting possibly a new uh, you know, entertainment system at home or a new computer, because it might be a true need, but it focuses on that we need to have the best so that everyone walks in and goes, ah, oh, look at you have and what I don't have. Advertising never focuses on love and grace. It never focuses on being content in life. Advertising never focuses your eyes on trusting God for all of your needs. Envy, let's kind of pull this all together now, just in case you missed it, envy is a lack 
of trust in God. It's a worry that God won't provide what you need. Christian, if you're comparing your life to what someone else has, you likely are not experiencing the abundant life that Jesus gave you, and, or is trying to give you. It's already in you, but you're not living it. Again, if you're comparing your life to what somebody else has, their successes, their family, their income, their prestige, their, their job title, their, you know, whatever their, their uh, diploma was in. If you're comparing yourself, you are likely not experiencing the abundant eternal life that Jesus offers us. And this is the harmfulness of envy. It just destroys us. So, what's Jesus' solution to envy? And this is where we want to be in Luke chapter 12, verse 22. And we're going to begin to look at what Jesus' solution is to envy. He, then Jesus said to his disciple, verse 22, Luke 12, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. And you know, some of you listening right now are worried about something something in, in, in some area of life that is just gnawing on you, that if I, didn't, um, if I don't take care of myself in this area, who will? Because I'm not positive God is taking care of me in my needs and my wants. And we see our lack of something as an obstacle. So we envy those that have when we lack. And Jesus begins this teaching, Luke 12, 22, to not worry about your life so much. Jesus goes on to say in verse 23 and following, for life is more than food, and your body is more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life since you can't do this very little thing, this adding one additional hour to your life because you can't even add an hour to your life, then why are you worried about a whole bunch of other things, about the rest of the things in your life? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do you not set your heart on what you will eat or drink? Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows what you need, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. You know, Jesus keeps teaching a theme that is throughout Scripture. Quit worrying. Fear not. I am with you. Um, I am here. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. And Jesus keeps teaching us, and you see it in verse 29, don't worry, because the giver wants to give you, and he will give to you. Consider the ravens. God feeds them. Consider the wildflowers. God clothes them. So how much more valuable are you than birds and grass? Worry drives to envy and fear-based lifestyle. So when we, when we worry that we're not going to have enough clothing or we worry that we're not going to have enough stores or stuff stored at home, we don't have enough computers, we don't have enough uh, television channels on, on Hulu, and you know, we need to have... Hulu and Amazon and Netflix and we need to have you know a number of other possessions when we worry about these things all the time it drives us towards a, a fear-based lifestyle which is what envy fuels itself on envy is such a, a part of Psalm 73 that that's why I wanted to point you to it verse 13 in Psalm 73 says surely in vain I have kept my heart pure in vain I have washed my hands in innocence. 
So in other words, when we face turmoil, when we face these struggles, and we have this mindset that, you know, it seems like it's all for naught that I'm keeping myself pure for God. It seems like it's all for naught that, I, that I'm doing all this stuff. When turmoil sets in, we begin to ask, why me, God? Why not them? How come you're not, not having them go through the struggles I'm going through? Why am I having to go through these struggles? And what I want to ask and pause for a second, is ask the question, are you currently in a place of resentment? In any way, with your neighbor, your friend, your brother or sister, with your parent, with an athlete, a Hollywood star, a musician, it doesn't matter who that person is, are you in resentment? And it's controlling you and it's burning you up. Well, let me explain to you what resentment does when it, when it has to do with envy. Resentment is like you drinking poison, hoping that the other person will die from it. That's what resentment does to you. None of us are immune, and we drink the poison of envy in a capitalist country. It's very common because of the amount of advertising. And, you know, before you, you maybe go off on some tangent and think, oh, Pastor Bill's some socialist or communist or whatever else, I am just saying, let's be realistic. We are Westerners. We live in a capitalist country. So we are bombarded constantly with wants, wants, wants. And often, and you know it, you have seen a commercial where 15 seconds before, you didn't even know that that product existed, and suddenly you have to have it or your life won't be worth living. None of us are immune. We all drink the poison of envy. We don't rejoice when others are doing well. We don't rejoice when they are receiving what they have worked hard for. And, and then after a while, we begin to wait to see if somehow they'll be destroyed by this thing. But instead, they continue to have success. They continue to be praised. And our resentment level goes up, up, up as envy destroys us from the inside. And it becomes our own self-destruction. And envy takes us down a self-destruction track. And so Jesus' solution, offered in Luke 12, verse 22 and following, that I just read from, is we need to trust God. That, that's the solution to envy. It's not some magic trick. It's not a bunch of pray certain prayers. It's not for you to go do certain actions. It's instead for you to have a check in your heart. You need to repent. Or repent how you're thinking about God and does he provide for me. You have to begin to trust God. Will you trust God? Or will you continue to worry that God isn't going to bless you? That's, that's, this is where the rubber meets the road when it deals with envy. Are you going to choose to trust that God knows what your wants are, God knows what your needs are, and he's going to fill those for you, or are you going to choose to just keep being resentful and focusing on somebody who has more than you because it'll become your own self-destruction? So Jesus is reminding you, child of God, verse 29, Luke 12, do not worry. And I'm convinced many of us, and it might be you, worry about things you have no control over. And you worry about things that you don't believe God is actually aware of. And that's where repentance, changing how you think, comes in. You need to change how you think about God. He understands your needs. He understands your wants. And Jesus... He confronts this trust issue with us. Our ongoing fears of, you know, can I trust God? Can I trust God? And that particular question, it, that goes all the way back to the garden when the serpent was talking to Eve and primarily said, you can't trust God because he's not telling you everything you need to know. And so that's where, where sin uh, plays within our heart we begin to think we can't fully trust god maybe i need to give a little bit i need to i need to add a little bit i need to, to help god in this area and jesus's solution though for envy is don't worry trust god is god keeping things from you no do you think that god doesn't want to bless you the answer is he does 
And he has. He's given you the fullness of himself within you to be content with, to rejoice in, to live in abundantly. And when we lack and we don't have what we think we need or what we think we want, we fear that God has rejected us, we fear that God has abandoned us, and we completely ignore Jesus' teaching. And so let me continue on in verse 32, Luke 12. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He's been pleased to give you the kingdom. And what is the kingdom? Well, we know that, that God, Jesus, is king of the kingdom, and we know that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere, so his kingdom is everywhere where he is. Any king, any monarch reigns in the kingdom in which they reside in because God resides everywhere. What is the kingdom that, that God is pleased to freely give? He is giving you his presence, his very self, his presence before you. And, he's, and Jesus says that he's not the Father, he is your Father. You are family to him. And God has given you, through the Holy Spirit that lives in you, his presence. And so Jesus begins to define how we overcome this desire to have, this desire to accumulate, this desire to envy other people and, the, and what they have. Is he says, why don't you sell your possessions and give to the poor? Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not fail, where no thief can come near and no mouth destroys. For where your treasure is, <clears throat> there your heart will be also. Verse 30, 34, there your heart will be also. And let me kind of just pull this all together now. There your heart will be also. Psalm 73, this psalm of what a resentful heart looks like and how it destroys us psalm 73 verse 21 says when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered i was senseless and i was arrogant i'm sorry i was ignorant i was a brute before you but your father christian has been pleased to give you his very presence in your life. And that should be enough. That should overcome the desire to have more money because you have the one who is value, who is, who is immeasurable in, in his uh, value. And where his presence is, that's where your heart will be. Jesus' solution to, God, to envy, trust God. That's his solution. Sounds simplistic, sounds too easy. Well, that's because it's not easy and it's not simple. Try it. Try to just trust God when you're envious of something and see how easy it is and see how simplistic it is. But God knows we can only handle a little at a time, so he tells us, trust him. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. He's always with you. He will provide what your need is when you need it. So as I wrap verse, or, uh, Psalm 73, verse 23, into the very closing of Luke 12, 32, Psalm 73, 23 says this, Yet I am always with you. You hold me in your right hand, God. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into your glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. My portion forever. Luke 12, 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you his presence, his kingdom. And that should be enough. And so this week as you go out and you get bothered by somebody's awesome house. You get bothered by somebody's advancement in their career or, or a, a salary increase. Or you get bothered that somebody else has become, become uh, successful in, in becoming healthier and you're doing the same things and it isn't working for you. Before you enter into that state of envy, 
and resentment and wishing that they would not have the success that they have been receiving. And before you get to that place, rest in God. Trust God so that envy doesn't overwhelm you. And that's going to that's gonna be accomplished only through prayer. That's going to only be accomplished by, by um, humbling yourself before God in prayer and saying, God, I'm all yours, and as much as I want to be more about me and more about uh, success or more about accomplishments, God, you are the only reward and treasure in my life because you hold me, you guide me, you take me, you are the strength of my heart. And so, Christian, I challenge you to do that this week when envy begins to overwhelm you. Heavenly Father, the believers in our midst want to follow you. We all desire to have that abundant, eternal life that you have offered us through Jesus Christ. And Father, because that's our desire, our hearts are going to follow that. And I pray this morning that as, as we look simply out at Jesus' solution for envy is just to trust you, Father. As we look at that, God, may we never sign that off as too simplistic. May we never say that's too easy or that's too um, common of an answer when it is the answer. Drive out from us, Father, any envy that we have towards others and replace it with a, a love and contentment for you and an excitement that that person is being blessed with something that, that, that you have given to them, something that they have maybe worked for, that's something that they have strived for and, and sacrificed for. God, let us rejoice with those who rejoice. And let us not find ourselves counted amongst those who envy and destroy, destroy ourselves in the process. And ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Hey, thanks a lot, Gathering Family. I'm looking forward again to seeing you next week. And uh, go out and be blessed. And bless the world with the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. The end.